Well, this week has gone a little bit differently than I anticipated. Um, Kathleen's prayer was answered. Um, I I'd sent her a text, and she never responded to it. I said, next time, be more specific. I I'd shared at a board meeting that I was on this stretch of long 12-hour days, and, and she told me the next day, she's like, I've been praying that you're, it'll just stop, that you can't do something. Well, it stopped this week. On Wednesday, I went to the doctor, and I have the flu. And so I had to clear my calendar, which um, I've not done for a long time, and just set. And I don't set well. Thankfully, God lined it up so that when I had to set, there were basketball games on. <laughs> and I got stuck in the basement. It was a terrible thing um, to be stuck in the basement. And I was sharing with Chad this morning, it's the first time in 17 years that I've been able to watch opening weekend of March Madness because I got married on spring break and Janelle's birthday was right before we got married. And so it's always coincided that our, her birthday and my, our anniversary would be on the opening weekend. And, it's, and this week, or this year, I was stuck in the basement. So I, I've had a pretty good week considering having the flu, but it's been a very different week than what I had anticipated. But as I have been sitting in the basement this week, um, I've been reminded of this discipline of celebration. And it's one of those things that when we're talking about spiritual formation, celebration is a part of what it means to be Christian. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we are called to celebrate. But celebration is not something that we typically think of as a Christian activity. As, as we were thinking, as I was watching the, the games this week and, and coming down to the end of each game, I think on Friday I watched, a, or Thursday, I watched a part of every game that was played. It was like, wow, I felt like it was an amazing experience for me. At the end of every game, there was one team that was just absolutely celebrating. It was so exciting to see Indiana among that number. And on Friday, it was good to see Iowa celebrate. And I am aware that they're playing right now, and I do have a short sermon in mind, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> I told Janelle, I was like, I don't know how many people I'm going to see just start migrating out of the church if they go too long. <laughs> Jack told me he doesn't need to, to get out too early, but don't go past 12, 15. But each, each game would end with a celebration especially when you see teams like Middle Tennessee State knock off Michigan State. And these guys are celebrating like they've never celebrated before. And when Indiana knocked off Kentucky last night, wow, what a celebration. Celebration is a part of who we are as Christians. It's not just about basketball. Celebration is a part of our story. We've talked about spiritual disciplines now for the last few months, and this will be the last sermon in this series. We've covered meditation. We've covered the church and worship and the sacraments. We've covered prayer. We've talked last week about the study of God's word. So we've talked about a number of these disciplines about what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Christ. But there are many that we haven't had time for, and fasting was one that I planned on touching on, service. Um, submission, solitude, simplicity are some of the spiritual disciplines I had hoped to cover and have them see. So perhaps we'll come back to those another time. But this morning I want us to talk about discipline. And I want us to talk about discipline, not just in the sense of, of or, or the celebration, not just in the sense of, of basketball celebrations, because those are short-lived, especially this time of year. When you see teams that do extremely well on Thursday, Cinderella's, and I think all the Cinderella's that were dancing yesterday got sent home from the ball. Celebration is a lot deeper than just um, being excited when something happens like that. And celebration has been a part of God's design from the very beginning. And I want us to look back at the book of Exodus and as we think about celebration, when God brought the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and we talked a little bit about this last week, that God brought them out, and the book of Genesis 
the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, these books talk about how a nation was formed and how a nation is supposed to live. And very soon after God brought the Israelites out of slavery, in fact, it coincided with the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, God set in place a plan for them to celebrate. In Exodus chapter 23, God said, Each year you must celebrate three festivals in my honor. First, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days the bread you eat must be made without yeast, just as I commanded you. They were to remember. They were to remember and celebrate the God who had just brought them out of slavery. God wanted the Israelite children to remember how magnificent it was to watch God's hand as he attacked the gods of the Egyptians. He never wanted them to forget how powerful it was to watch as one by one by one the Egyptian gods would fall. And the Egyptians would realize that the gods that they had been serving had no power at all. And so God said, I want you to celebrate three festivals in my honor. First, the festival of unleavened bread. Celebrate this festival annually at the appointed time in early spring, in the month of Abib, for that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. No one may appear before me without an offering. That's this week, just so you know. Holy week. Christians celebrate it, lines up with the Feast of Passover. You wonder why Easter shifts. It's because this shifts. It's this week leading up to Easter, the week leading up to Passover, that the Israelites were commanded to celebrate. And they were to eat special food. And they were to, to remember what God did in overturning the Egyptians. They were told to celebrate. Second, bring the festival or celebrate the festival of harvests when you bring me the first crops of your harvest. The, the celebration of first fruits, the cel celebration of harvest was when we get ready to collect our, our harvest, our crops from the field. Bring the first ones to God to, re, to give thanks to him for what he has blessed you with. God said, I want your first, I want your best, because I want you to remember where it came from. He wanted the Israelites to remember that the blessings that they had, all of the blessings that they had, were a gift from God. That they were not just randomly blessed, but they were intentionally blessed, and God wanted them to remember and he wanted them to celebrate this festival of harvest. Because, you know, for some people, celebrating the harvest doesn't happen very naturally. It's a good thing when the harvest comes in well. But some people, and I'm, I tend to be one of these, I tend to move as soon as something good happens, like, all right, what's next? And God said, no, take time and pause. And then finally, I want you to celebrate the festival of the final harvest. So not just after the first fruits come in, but the final harvest. At the end of the harvest season, when everything you have harvested is in from the fields, all of your crops are in, I want you to celebrate again. I want you to remember all of the blessings that I have given you. I want you to celebrate. Celebration is a huge, huge part of of what God had designed us for. And yes, there are laws that God want us, wants us to follow. Yes, there are rules, but the rules are not there to intimidate us or to take away our fun, but to help us to live life the most fully. And these celebrations are God's design to say, if you live life fully, then let's party. Let's have fun with this. At these three times each year, 
Every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign, the Lord. Don't forget, three times a year, God set aside that all of Israel would come back to celebrate. Celebration is a huge part of the biblical story. A huge part of the biblical story. In fact, much of what we see in the Old Testament, much, much of what was written down, was what took place when the Israelites gathered together. It's interesting to me as I thought about this yesterday and tried to process this. The Israelites didn't write much down in the in-between celebration times. It was when they got together to celebrate that things happened that were worth writing about. And that's often how life goes. It's when we get together, it's when we're all together that good things happen and we want to remember this. It's the celebrations in life. It's the Facebook moments or the Instagram moments, depending on which generation you're part of. That was a joke. I'm glad y'all got it. It's the Kodak moments. These are the things that we take pictures of. You know, I can remember growing up when pictures were a special thing. My dad always loved taking pictures, and he always had as fancy of a camera as he could afford, which wasn't much, but it was fancy for him. But you didn't waste the film. You only got the camera out when something special was happening. I look at the way that Janelle and I take pictures today. We go to the store, and we see something that we're thinking about for the girls that we're thinking about for later, and I just snap a picture of it. I can hear my dad saying, don't waste the film. those moments when everybody's together that things happen worth writing home about. And much of the story, much of the Old Testament story unfolds during these times of celebration. And much of our record of Jesus' ministry comes from these times of celebration. In fact, almost half of John's gospel comes from when they gather together for Passover. And this week, in between the triumphal entry and the Passover celebration and the crucifixion. Everything came together. And it was in these special moments when everybody was together that Jesus would preach his best sermon. It was in these special moments when everybody came together that the events would be recorded. These were the Kodak moments in the Gospels. And I think it's very appropriate that Jesus chose the Passover time as the time for his crucifixion. It's very appropriate for us to understand that it was not an ordinary thing that Jesus wanted to happen with as few people knowing as possible. Jesus knew when he was coming to town. And there's the part of this that has to do with the, the sacrifice of atonement that took place every year at this time, where there, a sacrifice would be made, and that's what Jesus was coming to be, was that sacrifice of atonement to forgive the nation of Israel for their sins, but to forgive all who would believe in him of their sins. But there's also the sense in which Jesus didn't just show up right at the time of the crucifixion. He was there for the celebration all week long. And he celebrated. And it was about having fun with his disciples, even in those tense, tense moments. As John tells us in John 13, when Jesus got his disciples together, he said, I have so earnestly longed for this time. I have been excited about this meal that we could celebrate together. I've got it all staged. We're going to have a photographer come in. Oh, well, I'm going to have this guy named Leonardo come in. He's going to paint a picture of it. Okay, it didn't happen quite that way. But, but it was that moment to remember. It was that, that celebration that was worth painting a picture for. Time of celebration. 
It's an exciting thing for Jesus to have all of his disciples together in one place. And they're sitting down and they're enjoying the meal. It's a celebration. And Palm Sunday was pre-planned to be a part of this celebration. So when we come to Palm Sunday every year as a church, we celebrate Palm Sunday. And we have the kids with their palm branches and the adults with theirs. And it's exciting. We celebrate this. This was pre-planned to be a part of what we do today. I love John's take on this, though. In John chapter 12, it said, His disciples didn't understand at the time that this, meaning Jesus coming in on the colt, was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. In other words, the events of, <clears throat> of Palm Sunday, the events of the triumphal entry, were pre-planned. The disciples didn't even know about it. They were students of God's word. They had studied the Old Testament. Several of them had large portions of it memorized. This is all, is all written down. As Matthew tells us, this was to fulfill the prophecy. But they didn't see it at the time. But Jesus made use of this opportunity to celebrate. This opportunity to fulfill the prophecy. <coughs> and celebration is a part of our story. As, as a procrastinator, um, I had planned on getting Janelle a birthday card, you know, like Thursday night, because her birthday was Friday. And I was on quarantine on Thursday night. Actually, I was on quarantine on Wednesday, and I think it was sometime during the day on Thursday that it hit me, uh-oh, I'm going to get found out for being a procrastinator. I don't think she's ever thought I wasn't. But So on Friday, I finally decided, you know what? I can't go out. I can't go to the store. I'm stuck in the basement. I'm going to make her a card. But I don't want her to get sick. So I'm going to make it on the computer and just print it out and say, hey, there's a card on the printer. Go get it. <laughs> Use the energy that you would have used to open the envelope to fold the card in half. But as I was putting this card together, you know, a part of what stuck out to me was all of the special moments. Now, one of the things that I love about Janelle is that she does a great job of making moments special. Every holiday for our girls, she goes above and beyond to, to make it a special event for them. And I, I loved just going through the pictures as I was stuck in the basement on Friday morning and just remembering all of the special times that she had put together. The table spread for Easter and, and for all the holidays for Christmas to see the girls all dolled up. And I promise you, I have nothing to do with the girls being dolled up. But to see all of the special moments that Janelle had orchestrated in our family's life is a very powerful thing. And it's a part of our story. As our girls grow and as they look back on, on their memories and and one of their favorite things to do is to go back and look at pictures as a family and just remember celebration is a part of those stories. And in fact, most of the pictures come in those times of celebration. It's a part of our story. It's a part of our stories in the big things of life. And, you know, as I was trying to pick out some pictures to put in Janelle's birthday card, you know, pictures of the girls being born and, and what a celebration that was but also celebration in the little things in life. Because there are a lot of things, a lot of little things in life that we can celebrate. A lot of little things in life that we can get excited for. For example, <laughs> as an Indiana fan, my entire life growing up as a Hoosier fan, there's only one game I care about a year. I don't care if Indiana goes off and gets absolutely annihilated by North Carolina next week. I don't care. They beat Kentucky. 
they beat Kentucky in the, in the championship. That's all that matters to me. I'm a happy camper. I'm wearing red. I'm excited because this is big for me, but it's really little. It's really little, but it's one of those things in life that we celebrate. It's one of those things in life that I celebrate. Janelle was kind of going back and forth through the basement yesterday, working on laundry, and, and she would walk through, and we would be talking, and something would happen on the game, and I would be yelling, and she would go, what? It's like, I'm sorry, just wait till this game's over, and then I'll have a conversation. The little things in life are worth celebrating as well, and I just want to leave that up there as long as I can. You know? Still feels so good. I thought about showing you a video of the Hoosiers celebrating in the locker room, but I thought that might be overkill. Here's a couple of thoughts about celebration. Celebration keeps us from taking ourselves too seriously. You know, one of the things, one of the challenges that we face in life is if we don't take time to celebrate, we just, that intensity keeps building and we keep taking ourselves more and more seriously. And we need that relief valve. We need that opportunity to just, okay, let's just have a good time. Celebration keeps us from taking ourselves too seriously. Celebration also gives us a new perspective. It, it reminds us of other people's point of view when we come together to celebrate. Perhaps as we celebrate, we hear, we talk to other people. Celebration shows us a new perspective. Celebration reminds us of our humanity. It reminds us that we really are human beings, and as human beings, we have weaknesses, we have strengths, but we're human. I actually never thought I would say this, but I really appreciated John Calipari, the Kentucky coach, in his news conference last night. I've never, ever in my life watched a news conference after a basketball game. And last night I watched all 45 minutes of it. But he said after everybody was critiquing his coaching and should you have done this, he said, you know, these kids, they're not machines and they're not robots. And I think that sometimes, especially when we're watching athletes, we tend to think of them as, you've got to hit that shot and forget their humanity. I think as, as we process celebration, celebration reminds all of us that we're not machines and we're not robots. We're not computers. We have feelings. We have emotions. We're human. And celebration reminds us to feel those feelings. It reminds us to experience those emotions. It reminds us that our humanity means that we won't be here forever. As many celebrations, we remember those who would have been here but aren't this time. Celebration reminds us of our humanity. The way that God designed celebration in the Israelite culture, was that celebration would be the reminder of their story. He wanted them to come together three times a year to remember God and to remember how God had influenced their story. None of us get to the point where we are today without having a story that brings us there. None of us. And understanding our story is a huge part of celebration. And celebration reminds us of God. It is in our times of celebration when we pause around the table to say that word of prayer that we remember how awesome our God has been to bring us all to this point. There's a quote that really struck me as I read this week. It said, the decision to set the mind on the higher things of life is an act of the will. That is why celebration is a discipline. It is not something that falls on our heads. 
is that it is the result of a consciously chosen way of thinking and living. When we choose this way, the healing and redemption in Christ will break into the inner recesses of our lives and relationships, and the inevitable result will be joy. Celebration is a discipline because it's not natural. It takes these moments of intentional celebration for us to remember, for us to allow Christ, Christ to come into those inner recesses of our lives as we acknowledge our humanity, as we acknowledge our story. In those times of celebration, Christ breaks through and allows us to feel not happiness that is fleeting, but true joy that comes from somewhere. And so as our worship team prepares to come, this is kind of my summary thought. One of the greatest joys of the church is the ability to live life together in all its many facets. We weep together, we get angry together, we face trials together, but most of all we celebrate together. A part of what we do in this building every week is, is celebrating. When something good happens for somebody, we celebrate that. There are certain times of the year at Christmas and in Easter in particular that, that we come together to celebrate what our God has done. And it's a part of us being the church that means that we celebrate. And so as we close this morning with a song of exuberance, a song of, of joy, let us celebrate with you reigns. Let's stand together.